Welcome, I'm Tiffany Dubose, Financial Wellbeing Associate here with Coastal Credit Union. I want to welcome you today to our presentation, which is going to be comparing retirement income strategies, 4% rule versus the bucket strategy. We have our wonderful team of experts here. We have Catherine Bryant, CFS Financial Advisor, Evelina Kaplap, Wealth Management Manager, and Drew Snyder, CFP Director of Financial Planning. Hello, everyone. Hi, Tiffany. Hoy. Hey, Tiffany. Good. Well, I know y'all are ready to jump into today's topic. Uh, we are trying to figure out the difference between these retirement income strategies of the 4% rule versus the bucket strategy. If we want to go ahead and get started with Evelina and yeah, join sure. our computer. <laughs> well, there certainly is a lot of verbiage on the screen, but the most important thing to note is that Coastal Credit Union has partnered with QSO Financial Services to provide investment products to its credit union members. These products are not NCUA guaranteed and can fluctuate with market activity. At this point, I'll turn it over back over to you, Tiffany, so we can start a conversation around who the winner is going to be here today. 4% oh. rule or the bucket strategy, if there is one. I have to find out. All right, so retirement income strategies. We are going to start with uh, Catherine. Um, she's going to tell us, uh, Catherine, we have to start a financial plan. What's that process? So the first process in the financial plan is data gathering, um, giving the financial advisor like myself what your financial picture looks like. What is it that you have that's going towards your financial resources that you are going to be using for retirement? So the first start step of the financial plan is for us to meet with the member and to gather that information and then put that information into our financial planning software with the help of our financial planning director, Drew Snyder. Um, so the first step is meeting, getting to know each other and gathering the information. And just to make it clear, Catherine, because coming from myself and probably a lot of viewers, we're not going to come into this thinking okay, I think I want to do the 4% or I should do the bucket strategies. Most cases, people aren't really going to know, correct? That's correct. I think these financial plans are kind of like a thumbprint or a fingerprint. It's They're unique to each person's individual situation. I would just add there that um, you know it's really important to start with the financial plan mm -hmm. because that's going to show the member if they've got a realistic goal for their for their income in retirement. And it's also going to touch on things like estate planning. Do you have the insurance in place? So it's not just ultra focused on your retirement and your money, but it's also focused on the other aspects of retirement that you need to consider like insurance and estate planning. Definitely more comprehensive. Good point. Okay. Now, is there a, a point of reference as far as how much income you will need to get started? Yeah, I think just to reiterate, I think that's what the doing the financial plan helps you figure out. Okay. And we, I think Catherine can say this too, but um, we have members that come to us and they have a very specific idea of how much money they want to mm -hmm. spend in retirement. And then we have other members who ask us, well, what's a realistic spending goal for my family? And uh, so depending on your situation, you know, we would back into that. But that is part of the financial planning process. I think what what I would recommend for anybody is, well, what is your ideal retirement look like? And, you know, try to mock up a, a retirement incomes plan or, or budget for your family. And, uh, and then we can verify if that works for you. And that would include, of course, starting with your fixed expenses. Uh, if you have a mortgage or rent or, you know, your insurance costs, all those things that you have to pay every month and then have a fun budget, you know, the discretionary money for eating out and entertainment and travel. And then once you do that, then, um, you know, we can make sure to see how that's going to going to work long term for your family and your situation. And one of the things that you mentioned, Drew, is about the insurance needs, right? So um, I don't know if our audience knows, but women have a tendency to live longer than men. So the long term care insurance needs are extremely important for a female audience. And there are misconceptions about, you know, who's going to take care of me when I'm older in those later years in retirement. You know, some folks think it's going to be my family or it's going to be Medicare. And with regards to Medicare, that's just not true because that just covers the acute care needs. So it's important to work with a financial professional to make sure that you get not only the retirement savings, but you're able to take into account your health care needs. 
So by starting with the financial planning, um, then you're able to decide which strategy is best for each individual. Yeah, that's right. And and I think what's also important to mention is that, you know, what you're going to find is you're going to write down what you want to spend in retirement, and then you're going to calculate what you have coming in from social security or a pension or some other source of income, maybe a rental property income or something. And there's going to be a gap there between what you want to spend and what's coming in. And I think, you know, a lot of people want to close that gap. Uh, Some people might be comfortable, you know, using their investments in their portfolio to close that gap on an annual basis by taking distributions from their 401k or an IRA or something. Other people may want to figure out ways to close that gap so they have that guaranteed income coming in to cover all those expenses. Catherine, you work with a lot of members. What do you think? How do people land on that? You know, normally they, the interesting thing is a lot of times when we talk about expenses, people will say to me, wow, I have no idea, right? Like they're not keeping track. So I think the financial planning process is a good starting point for people to start buttoning up not only what they're spending, but what resources they have in place. Um, But I think long term, knowing what those expenses are is really critical to the retirement income planning process. And with gathering all of that, um, would you say that you would have to be mindful of taxes as well? Absolutely. I think sometimes in the planning process that, especially for people that have a lot of qualified money, meaning IRA money, uh, when we start running that plan and start looking out to those years where they're required to take that, what's called a required mandatory distribution, they're sometimes very surprised that the amount of taxes they're having to pay in later years. Mm-hmm. So building the plan around an awareness of taxes, short-term and long-term, um, I think provides that individual with some guardrails on how to start taking that money and where to start taking those funds from. All right. So that brings us to getting into the differences between 4% and bucket strategy. Could one of you just tell us a little bit about the 4% rule and why 4%? Sure. So the 4% rule was developed um, over a 50 year period of time. I think it was from like 1926 to 1956, where a financial advisor tested different withdrawal rates in different markets. And the end result was that even in a, a period of a down market or strong up markets, as long as you didn't withdraw more than 4% from your portfolio, your portfolio should last last 33 years or throughout your retirement. So basically that's the 4% rule. It's kind of a steadfast, don't take more than 4% regardless of the ups and downs in the market. Okay. I would just add to that, that it's, um, you know, it's inflation adjusted. So some people might think that you start, I think the, what a lot of people say is, well, I take 4% and they're worried, well, 20 years from now, that's not going to be a whole lot of money. Well, it is inflation adjusted. Mm -hmm. When he did the research, um, he did increase it for inflation each year uh, to to account for the rising costs of goods and services that people are going to encounter in their retirement. Yeah. So the so the premise really was right that they establish a, a safe rate of return to give retirees confidence that they're not going to run out of money. In that was the priorities. idea. Yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. It's interesting for people to understand that financial planning really wasn't a thing until the late 80s, early 90s. And it's really because the 401k became the primary way for Uh people to save for retirement as pensions were kind of going away. So it allowed the financial planning industry to kind of evolve and because people needed that advice and that specific research that that gentleman did allowed for people to feel better about their withdrawals from their Mm -hmm. 401k that they were going to last their lifetime because they didn't have the pension like their parents did. And what are the specific um, advantages and disadvantages that you would like to point out with a 4% rule? I would say the the primary advantage of the 4% rule is its simplicity. It's very, it's a passive approach, uh, pretty easy for anybody to to implement, doesn't take a lot of of thought uh, or strategy. Uh, So that's, I think the primary advantage is its simplicity. Catherine, do you ha- can you think of another advantage for the four percent rule? I also think long term that f- one of the advantages, other than the inflation that's associated with it, the inflation is added to that four percent year over year. Um, I think the four percent withdrawal rate is probably low compared to longer term 
portfolio returns. So I think that is one of the advantages also because one of the disadvantages of the 4% rule is that it does, you know, the premise is based on you staying pretty, pretty committed to that 4% withdrawal rate. So, um, you know, I think that the advantage of it is that, you know, you probably will outperform that 4% over the long run. Disadvantage being that the plan or the premise is based on you staying pretty committed to that 4% rule. So you, you will see some growth, but that's why he was able to build in that inflation as yeah. well. I think it's important to note at this point that it assumed that the portfolio was invested 50% in stocks yeah. and 50% mm -hmm. in bonds. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, which brings up what I think is another disadvantage, sure. especially in the current environment where we have very low interest rates and low bond rates, 4% may not work because 50% of your portfolio is not really earning a whole lot of money going forward is kind of what I think a lot of people are thinking for bonds. It's important also to know that during the time period that he looked at this st this strategy, this study, uh, bonds were performing pretty well. Mm -hmm. It was yeah. a bull market for bonds. So that 50% of the portfolio, I think in the past 50 years is going to be higher than what we're looking forward to maybe in the next 10 to 20 years for bonds. Sure. Uh, we, so that's yeah. a that's a bit of a disadvantage there is kind of where we are in the current market climate. And then I would also say, remember, the other 50% is in stocks. Uh -huh. So if if you're starting your retirement with the stock market at a high and it doesn't perform as well because PE ratios, which are price to earnings ratios is kind of how we value stocks. If you start your retirement with high PE ratios, chances are there may not be a lot of uh, high returns in the early years and potentially negative returns, truthfully. So it doesn't take into consideration a potential like uh, drop in the market for the first couple of years too. Yeah. The protracted negative returns of the market, I think, are one of the biggest downturns to that 4% rule. And, you, you know, Drew and I, uh, working with clients all the time, you know, when I speak to clients, I don't really talk about a 4% rule. When they say to me, look, my, I'm terrified of outliving my money. We, we today start closer to 3%. Well, you know, let's let's keep it more current with what we're taking into consideration with our current interest rate environment. So I think people move a little. I like the idea of the 4% rule because it's kind of a, a simple idea to grasp. But I do think when you start working with a financial planner, I think it's a better conversation to see mm -hmm. if that really is realistic, especially starting out um, in a low interest rate environment and high PE ratios like Drew was saying. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. So to me, it sounds like, like you said, uh, one of the bigger advantages is simplicity, but you also have to be realistic with your individual financial situations as well. With that, we're going to take it on to our competitor here, the bucket strategy. So how does the bucket strategy work? So the bucket strategy is one of our favorites with our members, right? Because the, with the bucket strategy is something that I feel like for them, the transparency of seeing what assets are dedicated to their short-term emergency fund, their mid-term bucket of money they don't necessarily need now, and then their long-term bucket. The longer-term bucket being maybe those assets that we're putting a little bit more into a growth strategy and anticipation of some retirement income. So I think the bucket strategy for our members, what they love is the transparency of it and the clarity of it. They can see in each bucket where their assets are and what assets are, why are those assets in that particular bucket? You know, so the bucket strategy we use quite a bit, regardless of how complicated the individual members uh, scenario is, it does seem to resonate regardless. I would just add to that, that the, the overall concept is we talked about the gap between how much money you have coming in from social security and pension, uh -huh. and then, and then how much you want to spend as a retiree. And what we put in the buckets is, is the money that's going to fill that gap that's uh -huh. coming out of your investments. So like the short term bucket would have, uh, you know, we do your financial plan and you see, okay, I'm going to need an additional $30,000 a year in the first year of my retirement. So we 
plunk that into your your short term bucket. And I recommend people keep at least two to three years of, in that short term bucket. So if we just kind of project that out, then you'd have maybe ninety, a hundred thousand dollars for this individual in that short term bucket, right? And then we just sort of plan out the midterm and long term bucket as it goes um, beyond that. But that's basically, it, as Catherine said, that's you know, that's how it works. And while people, as she said, people love it because it does give some comfort in knowing where their money is going to come mm -hmm. from for the next three years. And you know that it's not at risk to the stock market. And as in contrast to the 4% uh, distribution strategy, you know, I, well, my concern with that is, is that as people kind of age into retirement, they become less risky and, and get more fearful of the market. And, and as we said, it's a 50-50 split between stocks and bonds. That's the assumption there. And we find that as our members get older, they actually don't want to have any stocks anymore because they're uncomfortable with having mm -hmm. to take money out of those with when they're volatile. I feel like the bucket strategy allows them to see that there is a portion of their money that they don't need to touch for sometimes eight or nine or 10 years, oh, yeah. depending on how we plan out the buckets. And that gives them that comfort to keep their money invested. And that's going to help them be more successful long-term as people are aging longer. And a lot of people do want to pass the money on to their family and their children and grandchildren. So, you know, having your money invested over the long term is going to help them grow their net worth and grow their assets in addition while they're retired. And because it's a, a visual strategy, um, we wanted to go ahead and to show the bucket strategy so that you could uh, explain it a little bit for all of us who actually want to see the buckets. Catherine or Drew, would you like to kind of go into this graphic? Yeah, I could, I'd be happy to, unless Catherine, you just wanted to. No, you go for it, Drew. Okay, yeah. So I, you know, part of my job here is to put these things together. So <laughs> I've, I have a lot of experience, but basically, you know, um, we're looking at the three buckets. Um, inside the bucket, you'll see that we have an assumed rate of return for that investment. And I have to say two years ago in that short-term bucket, we didn't have half a percent there. We had more like one to 2%. But as we were talking earlier, interest rates are very low right now. They've been systemically low for quite a while. And so what we want to encourage people to feel good about is knowing, hey, you can keep your money in a savings account earning a half percent and still have a successful retirement. So this shows them that it's actually going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, so you can see in the first three years, in this case, we put $120,000 in that short-term bucket, mostly here at our credit union and the uh, savings and checking account. And then we map out the next four to seven years and we figure out based on their financial plan how much money we need to allocate to that bucket. And based on the person's risk tolerance, we would allocate that into a portfolio of like as we used here or just as an example, maybe an annuity, a fixed annuity, balanced portfolio, which could be uh, stocks and bonds, mostly dividend paying stocks and um, and maybe some corporate bonds or government bonds. And then maybe even a CD if it makes sense, given what the return of the CD is. And then everything else that they have saved for retirement, we just plug into that long-term bucket. And in a lot of ways, it's invested pretty similarly to how they've been invested as a pre-retiree. And then what I like to do is aggregate all of those returns of the different buckets and show the member that on average, they're going to get probably about a 5.2% return if they invested this way. And we got the assumed rate of returns on that we put on the buckets there. And then of course that has to match up with their financial plan. If we assume that they're going to earn a 7% rate of return in their financial plan and the buckets turn out to show them earning 5%, that's not going to work. So we make sure that how they're invested in their buckets matches with their long-term success in their financial plan too. And just to reiterate also, um, Drew, because I know with a lot of viewers and just people in general sometimes feel like, oh my gosh, I don't have enough money to even talk to anybody. Could you please uh, just let them know that these are just numbers. Um, everything is individualized because people may look and say, well, I don't have $120,000 to put to the side, but this is just an example. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. And every bucket strategy I've ever done has been different. And we've done them for people that have clearly a lot less money than this and people that have had a lot more money than this. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just a proportion of their investments based on how much they're you know, going to live on in retirement. So yes, feel comfortable that we'll help anybody who wants to put one of these together for sure. Mm -hmm. 
Tiffany, most people are familiar with what's called asset allocation. And really that's how, how I present these buckets a lot of times to people is it's just trying to visually get an idea of the, the asset allocation mix of their holdings. But again, like Drew, Drew was saying, we do a lot of these and honestly, the bucket strategy for people is a way for them, especially uh, a lot of the uh, IBMers and people that are in the IT world used to working with spreadsheets. This kind of complements what they they're already putting together themselves a lot of times from a visual standpoint. And as we're talking about this bucket strategy and the 4% rule, um, it makes me think that many people continue to plan about how they are going to save for retirement throughout their years, but they may not give so much thought to how they're going to spend things down, which is one of the things that we're talking about right now. And this bucket strategy requires you to map out how much you'll spend each year in retirement ahead of time, right? So planning how you will use your money in advance may help you stick to that budget better that we're talking about in terms of how you're saving along the way. So this is really good for our audience to be able to see that there are more than one way to do these saving strategies and spending down strategies. Uh, a financial plan is, is going to help you answer that. And thank y'all so much. Now, and tying everything together, how do we figure out uh, which strategy is best for ourselves? I'll let Catherine handle that. Well, you know, honestly, my answer is for most people today, a combination mm -hmm. of the two ideas really is uh, what we're seeing a lot of people move to. They love the bucket strategy and then coming up with the withdrawal rate, right? Mm -hmm. Like similar to what he talks about in uh, the 4% rule. And I think the, the combination of the two is what most clients love. They love the transparency, the clarity uh, of the bucket strategy, but they also like the idea of knowing exactly how much they're going to be pulling from their portfolio from a percentage standpoint. Um, so I think a combination of the two, that might not have been the answer we thought we were going to come up with in the end. <laughs> I kind of thought we were going to go there. Um, but again, I think everybody's different. Everybody is going to come in. We are kind of like your the co-pilots for our members when it comes to financial planning, we can give them all the resources and the information and knowledge that we have to help them uh, take a, a better look and have a better perspective of their portfolio and what their retirement is going to look like. But at the end of the day, it's going to be them that decides what is the best fit. And, and we're just here to help guide them along the way and to continue to work with them. Yeah, I would add to that that um, I think the uh, the four percent rule is a good short term strategy. Meaning, like when you're just getting retired, you want to have an idea mm -hmm. of what you're going to be spending. Use that as a percentage as kind of a guideline to know what is a sustainable amount of money to take from your portfolio. And then using that information, then we can put together the bucket strategy. One thing that the four percent rule doesn't do that the bucket strategy does is that people go through retirement through kind of phases. Mm -hmm. So like the early phase, the, some people call it like the go-go retirement yep. phase. You know, you're, you've got the bucket list, you still have a lot of energy uh, early in retirement. So you're traveling a bit more. You might have some young grandchildren you're visiting, things like that. And then you kind of enter a phase slowly where you go into what's called a slow go phase. And and um, your spending does drop quite a bit in that phase because you're not traveling as much. You may not have as much energy to do that, or you've you've ticked off all the things on the bucket list. And then, so you're spending a bit less during that period of time. And then you enter a third phase, which is the the no go phase, where uh, unfortunately, <laughs> phase. what's going to happen to many of us is we're going to run into health issues that really just keep us from being able to do a lot of the things that we want to do. I uh, personally saw my parents go through all three of these phases, and um, unfortunately, what people don't appreciate is that that the no go phase, they think, well, you're not doing anything. It's actually can be more expensive than the other two because you're having to pay people to help you do things. Mm -hmm. um, I saw that specifically with my parents, where just case in point, they were able to take care of their yard and and you know upkeep and keep the plants you know healthy and whatnot. And then later on, you know, my dad stopped mowing the lawn. You know, so they're paying someone to do that. You know, you get a bad storm, you get limbs down in your yard, you're not picking those up, you're paying someone to do that. You're paying someone to come in the house to help you clean. You know, all these sorts of things do add to your expenses. So the bucket strategy, because it is a more uh, dynamic 
uh, way to look at your money on an annual or even every three or five year basis. As you go through those phases, you can make adjustments. With a 4% rule, it's, you know, it, I don't think that's going to really work for you over the long term, just saying 4% in, regardless of, of what's going on with your life. Because mm -hmm. uh, things are going to change in your retirement, believe it or not. It's not just static. Um, and, and you're going to find that you're going to have higher and lower income needs as you go through it. Okay. Well, that's great. So like y'all were saying, it's not as cut and dry as I was thinking either. I was thinking, hey, it's either going to be 4% or a bucket. But as Catherine was saying, it's going to, it could possibly be a combination um, of both, which is is great. And I see that that is important, like Catherine said, and y'all being the co-pilots or like I say, the financial coaches uh, for us. So um, that's a great segue into who is Coastal Wealth Management, Drew? Yeah, great. So yeah, we are a very experienced group of financial advisors and support staff that help our members here. We have over 600 million under management uh, with our members at the credit union. And what's great about working at Coastal as an advisor and a financial planner is that there are no Coastal mutual funds or insurance. So we have the ability to go out into the marketplace and find the right products and solutions that fit someone's strategy, whether it's a bucket strategy or the 4% or a combination thereof, uh, we can go out and find the right products that fit uh, what the member is looking for. And it's going to help them be successful as a retiree or you know, pre-retiree also, of course. Mm -hmm. And we're unbiased. We're all employees of the credit union. We work closely with other employees at the credit union as part of Team Coastal. Uh, we work with the branch staff that are helping our members with their, their loans, their credit cards, and their checking and savings savings accounts. And we work closely with Daymark Realty, who, um, you know, obviously helps people buy and sell homes. So we're definitely part of the team. And part of that is helping our members just putting the right foot forward. And then, of course, the last thing is we always take the planning approach. If you watch this video, you probably should have appreciated that, that we really do allow the financial plan to direct our recommendations and make sure that we're doing the right, uh, making the right uh, decision with the member to have them a happy, positive a financial future. And last, uh, we do work with a lot of local CPAs and attorneys to help people make sure that they're making great tax decisions and have their estate planning in order. So it sounds like we're here with Coastal. We have a great, a lot of opportunity. We have great partnerships within our company with other departments, as well as recommendations for outside to help all of our members. Uh, Catherine, if you would like to tell how our program works. Absolutely. So kind of pulling us all together. Like I said in the beginning, when we first sit down with the member, we the first step is getting to know them a little bit, having a conversation, them getting to know us. And this is where we're going to get some details on their finances and their financial goals. The next thing we do is we work with Drew, our financial planner, and we go through the financial planning software. Um, we review the goals with the client and we put the comprehensive plan together. And once we put that comprehensive plan together, what I can tell you that we do here at Coastal, and I know all the advisors here are great at doing this is, you know, we take our time to go through this plan because it can be very complicated. It can be over 30 pages. And basically what we do is we go through it. We, we confirm the information that we put into it based on our prior conversations. And then we go over the outcome. And then the biggest part of, I think, the financial planning process with the member is the follow-up. If you end up working with us to put together some um, investments to help um, you reach your financial goals, we are constantly updating these financial plans for you. And we are then bringing them back to you to go over what changes have been made. So Coastal offers its members from a financial planning standpoint, you know, multiple stages of touches where we not only gather the information, we go over the goals, we present the information, but we're constantly updating it as your financial situation changes. And again, it's all complimentary. It's part of what we offer here to our members at Coastal Wealth Management. Awesome. Well, right Excellent. now we are going to uh, Evelina. I think you wanted to say a few things. 
Yeah, actually, Catherine added it right at the end. I was thinking to myself, I think we forgot the most important part, which is to let everybody know that it's a free financial review that we provide to our members. But she caught that right at the very end. And uh, one thing I did want to add on top of that is um, with regards to how often we review the plan. I mean, like Catherine said, it's all based on your preference. You can meet with, for example, uh, if your Catherine was your advisor, quarterly, annually, as life events occur, right? You could get married, you can have children, grandchildren, uh, any and all those things come into play as an, on a needed basis. Um, it's a continual conversation and we don't send you to any 800 numbers. We are a team of individuals that are always available to speak to our clients and our members over the phone, via email and so forth. So you're never gonna be on hold for 25 minutes waiting for somebody to come up on the phone then they get transferred again or they just hang up on you. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. <laughs> yeah, that's the best. <laughs> well, we do have a few questions uh, from some of our viewers. Um, first question, where can I get retirement income while I wait for Social Security? Yeah, I think um, that's a really, really good question. And we kind of touched on it in when I was referencing doing the financial plan. And then you find that you have that gap between what you want to spend and then what you are have coming in from Social Security or a pension or or maybe rental income. You know, most everyone has Social Security. They may not have the other options. So, you know, they're only a uh, guaranteed source of income could be social security. And um, so a couple things that we can do there through the, depending on the person's uh, risk profile, uh, some people are willing to, you know, invest in some stocks that pay dividends. Some people uh, just want to keep it all in cash. And, and the bucket strategy that we would put together would basically kind of uh, plan that out for them. And so my recommendation would be to obviously sit down and see what that gap is and then look at your resources and see how much money it was going to take to fill that gap uh, between, let's say, age, you know, if you wanted to wait from till age 65 or 70 to to wait for Social Security, you know, if you're 62 and you're waiting till 70, that's a long time. And that's going to be a lot of money that's coming out of the portfolio. You have to be comfortable with that. Other things we can do is um, is use an annuity. An annuity um, is a good uh, option to fill that gap. And so some people have been looking to that as they don't have pensions anymore. Uh, so, uh, so they're using what some people are calling a private pension, which is really an annuity that has a guaranteed payout over a period of time. Anything you'd add to that, Catherine? No, I think that's, um, I think that, you know, it's all going to go back to, like you said, figuring out what that gap is. That's the biggest thing. And then kind of backing into the resources available to fill that gap. And we have another question. Uh, where can I find a safe stream of income when interest rates are so low? So I think Drew already touched on this already. Um, there, you know, we do find that members that we're working with in this low, uh, prolonged, low interest rate environment are looking for alternative types of investments. And you know, in in the annuity space, there are definitely some things that are going to mirror what the member is used to seeing in a certificate of deposit and that you're not going to see, you know, your principal fluctuate, they can become more complicated. So it does take a conversation to sit down to see what direction or which particular perhaps type of annuity would work for you. And the other thing I've found in my practice is I find clients that have perhaps inherited uh, from their parents dividend paying stocks that they never really thought of for themselves. And so they're taking a second look at those type of things, companies that they're very familiar with that have been uh, in their parents' portfolio that uh, paid consistent good dividends um, that they start to look at as well in a low interest rate environment. But again, it all gets down to a comfort level and finding something within your risk tolerance to, to find that, that return you're looking for. Drew, Evelina, do you have anything to add? I'm hoping I have that kind of inheritance somewhere. I have to say. Yeah. <laughs> you know, that was a very, really good answer. The only thing I would add to the one of the advantages of dividend stocks, if you're comfortable owning stocks, is that the dividends are tax advantaged. So there, you pay uh, capital gains tax on on the dividends, well, capped at fifteen percent. So unlike uh, you know 
anything you have at the credit union, a CD, uh, even most bonds, you're going to pay uh, regular taxes on on those. So there are some tax advantages to dividend stocks. And truthfully, right now they're they're paying higher yields than most bonds. Sure. So um, a lot of pension funds and you know people that invest in for big accounts um, for lots of people, insurance companies, pension funds are using dividend stocks instead of bonds these days. Uh, of course, that can change depending on uh, the uh, economic environment. Okay. Our next question is, should my investment buckets change based on my risk tolerance? For sure. When um, when we put together people's financial plans, um, one of the most important factors in creating that bucket strategy is their risk tolerance. Mm -hmm. You know, the, uh, we have some members who are comfortable with having two years for that short-term bucket. I've had other members that say, "I want guaranteed income, no risk to my principal for five years." So their short-term bucket is a five-year bucket, and. Uh, and we find them as highest interest paying CDs, annuities, um, money market accounts, whatever we can that's not going to risk their principal for that first five years and they have access to it for income. So the risk tolerance is extremely important in creating those those buckets. And, um, and we certainly factor that in. Do you have anything to add to that, Catherine? I think the transparency of the buckets also gives the client peace of mind. A lot of times um, people know what their risk tolerance is and we build the buckets around it. Um, and then they see a downturn in the market and they start to focus on that longer term bucket that might have a little bit more exposure to the equities in the stock market. So I think the nice thing about the bucket strategy is it does take into consideration the risk tolerance, but also the transparency of it allows us in these negative market environments to kind of redirect the individual or the client and remind them that the short term bucket is really where we're going to be able to provide them with that immediate need of income. And we don't really necessarily need to worry about that longer term bucket during these short volatile market periods in the market. You know, they're, they're designed to take advantage of the volatility. So I think it's the bucket strategy is a flexible, transparent strategy. And I, what I love about it is kind of what Drew said is we start from the very beginning based on the risk tolerance. We have some people that want five years, some people that only want two years. You know, they're flexible. If your risk tolerance truly changes, we just move a little bit more money towards that short term bucket for you. The buckets can refill each other also. I've worked with clients on that as well. Use that mid bucket to kind of sometimes refill that short term bucket, you know, if your risk tolerance or your income needs change in a short period of time. Great. So they are refillable. That was something that I was that popped yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> we don't refill them, but the assets inside. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, one last question. Um, how do I know if I've saved enough for retirement? Do a financial plan, work with a coastal wealth management advisor, take advantage of Drew Snyder's skill set. <laughs> you get to that answer. Yeah. I mean, and that's that's a great answer. But of course, there are obviously lots of other um, tools out there that you can do some projecting of your own retirement using your 401k plans, you know, tool that's built into it, or maybe, uh, you know, Fidelity or some other firm might have a free tool that you can use. There are lots of them out there for sure. You know, obviously we'd be happy to help you and make sure that you're making good assumptions on what the inflation rate is that you're using inside there or what rate of return. We've seen a lot of these that people have done themselves and they've mm -hmm. assumed a rate of return that maybe they earned last year, which was like 12% and just assumed that it was going to be 12% throughout their retirement and, uh, and a low inflation rate, let's say of 2%. Most people are going to be successful if you've saved pretty much any money, <laughs> you know, if you get a 12% return and a 2% inflation rate. So it's important if you are going to do it yourself that you understand what the assumptions are that are built into the plan and that you take that into consideration. You know, that's why we're here as professionals. We do this every day mm -hmm. uh, to help people make sure that they're doing a plan that's actually accurate and sustainable. 
you know, it's and it's glad I'm glad that you mentioned that projection tool. I use one of those myself. And and I'll admit that there are times where it tells me that I'm just not on track to my savings and and I don't have a crystal ball. So I'm I'm no different than the rest of the audience in that I have to work with our team, you know, a team of professionals that can help in creating a plan to hopefully get me on track and perhaps others that can relate with that and seeing that they may not be on track when they see those little projection pie charts and bar charts and whatever else is shown, depending on what uh, platform they use. Okay. I would also say that we've had people come in who are concerned because they've run those tools mm -hmm. and it says they can't retire. Mm -hmm. And then we find out that they forgot to include social security or they forgot mm -hmm. to include their pension or, mm -hmm. you know, something was missing in some respect. Mm -hmm. And, and so we can help ease those concerns if, if they feel like they're really not on track. Mm -hmm. Good point. One thing I'll just add to that um, is when people want to know if they've saved enough for retirement, Drew mentioned that a lot of times we see people overestimate the returns. And, and a lot of times they'll come to us and say we work, they work with XYZ um, advisor or firm and they're fantastic. And we'll take a look at that plan and they're showing double digit returns out into property, you know, for the rest of their lives, they're expected to get a 10% return or above. And the plan looks fantastic. But one of the other things that I can tell you, other than giving them a realistic return that I, I think um, we bring value to is helping them really understand what their expenses are at different stages of retirement. And Drew kind of touched on this as well. But a lot of times what I see also is people underestimate what their expenses are, either even short term. Um, so I think knowledge is key in trying to not only working with a financial professional, but, you know, having the knowledge of what it is you have from an expense standpoint and an asset standpoint and working with someone to help you uncover some of those things you haven't thought about, like healthcare costs and things like that, that could derail the plan. Definitely. So I think, you know, to answer this question, how do I know if I've saved enough for retirement? You know, until you sit down and you start really looking at the numbers and looking long term, um, I don't think that many, many people know. But once you start that process, I think the process itself kind of gets you to that answer. Yeah. So in summation, for all of our viewers, um, as you've heard it from uh, Drew, from Catherine, from Evelina, of course, you could try, you could do it on your own, but we all need a financial coach. So uh, knowledge is key. Uh, knowledge is powerful. And we have a wealth of knowledge sitting right here at Coastal. So whether you're an existing member or a prospective member, why pass up on something that's free? Something that could help you in the long term. Uh, so uh, now I want to give you our information on how you can reach us so we can get the party started. Uh, <laughs> our phone number here is 919-882. 6655. Our email address is wealthmanagement at coastal24.com. Our website is coastalwealthmanagement24.com. So these are all ways that you can contact us. And as Evelina mentioned, you're not going to be put on hold. Uh, you're not going to be transferred somewhere. Or hung else. up on. <laughs> or hung up on. <laughs> this is coastal. So um, please get uh, contact us. And I wanted to thank all of our uh our team members here. Thank you for all of this information. Um, and until next time, I'm Tiffany Duvos with Coastal Credit Union, and we'll see you next time. Thank, Thank you. Tiffany. Thank Thanks, you. Everyone. Bye -bye. Have a great day. You too.